Warning, this podcast contains explicit sexual language and should only be listened to at work if you're looking for an excuse to connect with your HR representative. Additionally, all mentions of the word women include cis, trans, NB, gender queer, gender fluid, and those still figuring it out. Yes, you. You are welcome here. Will you open up with me? These pages they can feed your innermost desires. Do you feel inspired? Are you getting what you need? Are you coming curiously? A secret safe with me. And here you can simply be yourself. Hi, y'all. Welcome back to Jace Reads Romance. I'm Jace, she, they. And this is our community that celebrates and empowers women, cis, trans, and be, if you want to be here, I want you here, about sex and sexuality through the reading of romance novels. And I am so excited to welcome our guest today, Anita, who is a passionate romance reader with a unique perspective on this genre that we love so much. So Anita, introduce yourself and say hi to our wonderful listeners. Hello, wonderful listeners. Uh, I am Nita. Uh, I, as Jay said, love reading romance. Uh, To be fair, I love reading and stipulation. I will read anything, but I do particularly enjoy romance, which as Jay said, is possibly conundrum and head uh, scratching for many people because I'm also asexual. And there is a lot of question about, do ace people enjoy romance and thus confusion between ace and aromantic? I would love to take just a moment for our listeners. If you have not heard the term ace or asexual or aromantic, what does that mean for you? And what does that mean for maybe the broader community as well? Because as we know, there is the community and then there is our unique self. So what does maybe the general definition of ace and aromantic mean? And then what does it also mean for you? So asexual is typically defined as lacking in sexual desire. Now, with many terms in the LGBTQIA plus world, that is an umbrella term. It encompasses terms like demisexual, graysexual, egosexual, and many more. Uh, aromantic, similarly, is lacking romantic interest. So you may hear alloromantic or allosexual, and those are people who experience on any level, romantic uh, feelings or sexual feelings. So if you are asexual, it means that you define yourself as not feeling sexual uh, impulses or anything like that, which is, of course, where you have those shades of gray, if you'll pardon the pun, (laughs) um, because you can have people who are demi-gray, ego, and so forth. So demisexual people will feel or typically feel sexual attraction under a certain set of circumstances. It may be one or two people. It may be after an established emotional connection. Um, Gray sexual people, again, it's very similar to demisexual, but there are there are shades within that. Egosexual people, we may feel sexual impulses, but not with other people. So they might enjoy reading romance or erotica or watching porn, but the minute you introduce another live human being into it, they go running for the other direction. You may also hear terms such as sex repulsed, uh, which means that they are on the ace spectrum and they really want absolutely nothing to do with sex. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to see it. They don't want to be around it. Some people are sex tolerant, but disinterested. So it is a very wide, broad spectrum encompassing roughly 1% of the world's population. Um, You know, unfortunately, Given the makeup of the world, many LGBTQIA plus members do underreport. So it's estimated that that number is about as high as 4%. But either way, it's a very small percentage of the population who identify as asexual. Thank you. And thank you for giving us that definition. And also to our listeners who heard those terms for the first time and maybe identify with those terms for the first time in your life. Welcome. We are so excited that we can be part of that journey for you. Or if you've never heard of those terms and you just didn't know that was an option, yes, please do your Google, understand that the spectrum is big and all-encompassing and 
there's still a place for you at the Romance Readers table. We want you here. We're excited to dialogue with you. And I will add to that that you are not broken. There is nothing wrong with you. And you are absolutely A-OK the way you are. Ah, uh, yes. I'd tell you to sing, but I don't think you would. <laughs> no. No. So no, I don't think people would appreciate that. <laughs> that is OK. So, Anita, how long about have you been reading romance novels? That is a very good question. And my civ-like memory is going to dredge up somewhere around age, oh, I don't know, 10 or so. Not that I necessarily realized what I was reading at the time. <laughs> my parents made a very big mistake when I was about two. And they let me start reading alone. <laughs> the first book that, that I ever read to myself was a book of Greek mythology. Second mistake. <laughs> and it sort of spiraled from there. So... I had a voracious appetite for a long time, and I would be given books that were well above my reading level as a on a chronological scale, but not necessarily beyond my ability to read them. Now, comprehension and maturity are are different things. Yeah, so I would different. say, you know, it, they were elements in books that I didn't understand, and then they were elements in books that I didn't want to understand. <laughs> so, mm. um, amazing. Um, so. You've been reading romance novels for, let's go with, a few decades. No need to ask how old you are. Keep it to yourself. And what, at what point did you start to notice that your maybe sexual desires did not match what you were reading? Or did that conversation happen much later in your own brain? I was always confused by it because I never understood what they were feeling. I was sitting here saying, okay, like, this is weird. Like, what do you, like, okay, this is, sure, I, I guess you can feel that, but why? I, I, I could not understand it. And when I was in high school, when the internet was in its nascent stages of what it is now, I went digging and I, I, and I still don't know how I stumbled across this, but somehow I came across the term asexual and it was like a light bulb went off. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. Now I understand. Um, and of course, it took me, like many other people, well over another decade to really accept that. And part of that is the lack of acceptance and tolerance from other people. I had told an English teacher who wanted us to watch a movie um, and she had said, you know, hey, just to give you a heads up, there's some some kind of explicit stuff in here. Uh, I will not be skipping over it. Y'all are old enough. I think we were 16, 17, 18, something like that. And she felt that we could handle it. And I said, look, I don't feel comfortable with this. You know, I'm ace. This really makes me uncomfortable. Can I please be excused for however long that scene is? And I got back, no, that's not real. You'll be fine. And it wasn't until I tried to crawl under my desk and cover my ears with my hoodie that my teacher understood I hadn't, in fact, been lying, that I wasn't making it up, and that I really was uncomfortable. Um, so experiences like that definitely set me back. That plus general societal expectations that you have to be, have a partner. You have to be happily engaged in some flavor of sex or romance or insert term of choice. Um, and it took a very long time for me to deprogram myself from the societal expectations and the negative responses that I'd gotten to really be like, no, I am ace and I really couldn't care less what you think. I'm so glad that you're at the place now where you can proudly state that, where you can be yourself um, openly and with pride. How do you think romance novels either helped you or maybe even set you back in that journey? Oh, God. So I would say it was a little bit of both. Um the confusion factor was high because I, I literally could not understand or empathize. You know, if I read an action book, I could understand going out running and, you know, jumping up and doing all these activities. Or if I read a mystery, I could understand and I could feel the emotion of going on a clue hunt. But I couldn't understand the sexual desire. Romance, sure. Sexual desire, not so much. And it really, it confused me. But by the same token... It also offered me a window into something that because I don't understand it or experience it, I can at least see it. So rather than having a door slammed to my face, at least there's an open window that I can go look through if I want. Um, for lack of a better analogy. Analogies are great. 
So as someone who doesn't necessarily feel sexual desire, do you enjoy reading erotic romance? Because there are definitely romance novels or stories with romance that have no sex. Is there something that really drives you to put that back on your to be read list, TBR list, for those of you who are not book nerds, uh, books that contain erotic scenes? And not just a old Hollywood style fade to black. Sure. Uh, I, as I said earlier, I will read anything, uh, but I have to be in the mood. I have to be in the right headspace to read something that's got erotica in it. Um, and the more explicit, the more blatant, I really kind of have to have the headspace for it. That said, sometimes I skip over things. Sometimes I don't. Sometimes I read through them. And again, it's a way for me to sort of understand what the rest of the world is talking about when they say, oh my God, that was so fantastic. And I sit and you're saying, what the hell are you people talking about? So it gives me that opportunity to feel some flavor of connection or understanding. Um, so I will read them. Uh, sometimes I even enjoy them. Be, if it's well-written and you can, it, I can feel like I'm in the scene and I can feel the emotions that the author has crafted, then I think it's fantastic. Sometimes it's just really badly written smut and I'm sitting there shaking, <laughs> saying, okay, this just, no, there's no realism here and I'm out because that's, that's what I'm connecting to is the realism of it or the idealism of it. Because let's be real, just because it's written doesn't mean it's real or realistic, but it can be idealistic. And that is definitely something that attracts me because in an ideal world, I could feel this, I would feel this. So the idealism and the realism uh, when I'm in the right mood for it, are definitely something that I do enjoy. That is such an amazing perspective to think about that even if it's not something for you, the story and the emotions and the characters really drive you. And I'd love to just dive deeper into that. Um, for You've said that you are asexual. Are you aromantic? And if not, um, if you are closer to the alloromantic? <laughs> If I'm getting that term correct. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. That spectrum. What what do you look for in a romance novel? What do you see in these relationships that are appealing or not appealing or um, to, to you as a reader? I see possibility. That's what I see. And that's what I enjoy is the possibility that this exists or that other people could see this and enjoy it. Now, I do read books that have ace characters or demi or gray, and some of them are, are definitely better than others. But one of the most common themes I've found in the ones that do have ace characters is that there are incredible levels of communication between the characters. So the ace characters advocate for themselves. Um, Sometimes they're in stages of discovery and sometimes they have recently discovered their identity and sometimes they are firmly entrenched in their identity. But the common theme amongst all of them is communication with their partner. And in the, I would say the vast majority of those characters are allosexual, the partners. So it, it does require a bit of compromise and clarity and communication. And again, I see possibility there. Um, so I do edge towards the romantic end of the the romance side of it. So I am asexual, but alloromantic. Um, so again, I'm connecting to that emotion of it. So I, if you ask me to where on the ace spectrum I fall, I will usually say somewhere between demi and gray, because if there is emotion involved, I can, which is not to say I do, but I can feel some smidgen, some tiny little spark of sexual desire fleeting though it may be. So the romance of it, the, the emotion of it is what brings me, what connects me. Okay. So obviously my next question has to be representation in books. As someone who's been with this genre for many years, representation of asexuality and really a broader spectrum of, of romantic orientation, sexual orientation, gender, all of that is still, is still increasing. and um, for those people who are listening or curious and want to maybe get their own window into this world, what are the books that you feel that you were reading about uh, that have really done a good job of showing what it means to be ace? 
the best books that I have read with ace representation have also been sapphic. And I think it's because there's the duality of you're already marginalized. You're already part of this community and you have language for heightened communication. So stretching to include another umbrella um, group is not such a stretch. I have found that on the whole, the emotion in romance in LGBTQ authors tends to be better than the emotion in heterosexual author books. Not always, because there are some that are just truly spectacular. But on the whole, if I'm going to put an average on it, I have found that LGBTQ authors have a better depth of emotion or breadth of emotion. And when it comes to asexual characters, those who who really knock it out of the park tend to be sapphic writers. Can you, for our listeners, define what sapphic is? Sure. Uh, Sapphic is uh, derived from Sappho, the famous Greek lesbian um, on the uh, Isle of Lesbos. Uh, So those who are considered to be sapphic are defined as women who love women, um, whether that are that includes people who are non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid. If they identify as female bodied, female minded, um, sapphic is the overall encompassing term uh, for women loving women or WLW or FF or take your pick. Thank you. Oh my gosh. And we got a history lesson on the origin of that word too. You can see where that Greek mythology book really paid off. Sorry, you got (laughs) stuck with the nerd today. And that's it. That's all of us are nerds about this. So for the most part, are there any books that you would recommend or series that you found did a really great job, regardless of what the couple at the center of it is? If someone's interested in reading a book that you, again, personal opinion, found to be a really good representation of Ace. So one of my favorite Ace books is by Jax Mayer, J-A-X-M-E-Y-E-R, and it's um, Rising from Ash. Uh, And one of the characters is very clearly Ace, and the other is the epitome of a playgirl. Um, Love them and leave them, and somehow the two of them come together. And the character growth between both of them is just fantastic to read. Uh, and for those of you who w- like the spicy, there's a little bit of spice. For those of you who don't like the spicy, there's not enough that you'll be running screaming, I hope. Um, but it, it is, it's, it's a very well written book. And the ace representation is one of the best that I've seen. Um, and somewhere I have a whole list of which characters are ace, but I'm going back through three years of book logs. So it might take me a moment to find the rest of them. Hundreds of books. No doubt. <laughs> so as we've, we're moving forward in, in not just the romance novels, but our world, what trends have you seen, both in terms of ace representation, but just romance novels in general? What, what excites you about where this genre is going as someone who is a voracious reader of romance novels? I just like seeing the fact that they exist, that they're more mainstream, that there's more representation across the board. Um, I read a book a little while ago where one of the characters was Demi. Both main characters were uh, overweight. Both main characters were Jewish. Uh, Both were kinky, uh, different flavors of kink. So it's like, I don't care how many points of intersectionality you thought you could find in this book, multiply (laughs) it by at least five. And then there they were because they had non-binary friends. They had trans friends. I mean, if you open that umbrella, there is someone from every flavor of it in this book, well-represented. And when I say well-represented, I mean, well-represented. I mean, these are, you'd think you could be walking past them on the street. So real and vivid characters. Um, So the fact that it's not just ace representation, but it's ace representation in the kink community or in the BDSM community, because there is both separate, distinct and overlap. It's the representation of trans characters. It's the representation of um, poly groups and polycules and characters. The acceptance that society is slowly, very slowly 
making available on a broader stage is allowing for authors to feel more comfortable in sharing their stories and sharing their ideas. Um, and I, I just think that's fantastic because one, there's something for everyone, literally, but two, it's there, it's accessible in this day and age, we have it. Yes. If some of those terms were not clear for our, re our listeners, please go back and listen to our definitions episode to learn more about polycule, BDSM, uh, kink in its various forms so that you stay up to date. So in that list, you mentioned some more uh, intimate or smaller groups. You mentioned our kink community, you mentioned polycule, you mentioned all of these things. What does that give you as someone who might not be interested in participating? How do you find connection to these different groups of people, especially these smaller, more niche um, groups or sexual preferences or orientations? What drives you to learn and experience? And are there specific groups that you or specific tropes that you keep coming back to in your own reading? I don't know if there's a specific trope that I come back to, um, because if it's well written, I'll read it. When it comes to kink or BDSM or polycules or any of these other groups, um, it, again, I see possibility. So it took me a long time to realize that just because I'm ace doesn't mean I have to be stuck in the heterosexual mindset of finding a partner. Okay, cool. So that opened up the rest of the population. Um, and same thing that just because some insert number percentage of the world is monogamous doesn't mean that that's what I have to be either. So I can have partners who have uh, sexual relations with themselves and meet emotional needs or physical comfort needs. You know, I can get that met without having to feel anything else. So once I removed a lot of the barriers of my societally trained brain to how a relationship is supposed to look or work, everything opened. And what I like about reading all of these different types is it reminds me every time I read them that this exists, that this is a possibility. So we say kink and we say BDSM and we automatically assume sex, but it doesn't have to be. There are many members in the kink community and the BDSM community who don't have sexual contact or who don't have sex. Some just go for the impact component or for the DNS component. Um, everybody gets something different out of it. And again, in those communities, the level of communication is stratospheric by relative comparison. So seeing good communication modeled, and I have absolutely put down books that had very bad communication and made me feel squidgy about the character saying, but was that really consent? Like, let's talk about that. Oh, so I, I want to like throw my hands in the air and scream hallelujah. Yes. Oh, yeah. So when I'm reading, I, I'm absolutely in the back of my mind holding on to all of these things. And I will put down books that I don't feel are well written. And that that could be my personal take on it. I, I have put down books where I don't like the level of consent, but I will absolutely pick back up books that have fantastic consent, communication. Um, and again, I come back to possibility. For me, it's a reminder that just because the door is closed right now doesn't mean that it always is, or that just because right now I don't have a partner or partners doesn't mean that that's not the case for the future. It just means that right now I don't have that. Absolutely. I love that view of kink. And I'm going to grab on to that conversation of communication and something that I think really does lack in general in the mainstream heteronormative cis world is this idea that sex still needs communication with it. And as someone who has read kink or BDSM or DNS or just any other thing, the level of communication between partners is just exponentially greater. And that leads to, I found, just a, a better relationship between the two. I find that more and more 
books that are coming out that have that diverse group of humans, whether it's their sexual preferences or their uh, their orientation or or whatever it is, anything that isn't mainstream, those humans and those characters talk to their partner in a way that those who are raised to be heteronormative monogamous people, or maybe that just is who you are, don't get that level of communication from their partners. And I would encourage a lot of our readers, hopefully our listeners who are readers, um, and Nita, tell me if you agree, that just because it isn't your preference or your kink, you can learn so much from reading books centered around those types of relationships, kink, BDSM, DNS, polycule, because those characters and those people have to do so much work with their partners. And it really reminds me that the communication is the most important part of the sex. That like, that's where uh, things can get muddy and where things can become incredibly clear. Oh, I agree completely. Um, I, in recent years, have skewed much more towards indie authors or independently published or small publishing houses um, away from mainstream. And sometimes when I go back and read books that I had really fond memories of, I sit there saying, whoa, okay, <laughs> time out. Let, let's, let's back up and talk about this because, wow, did I miss this the first time through. So the more I read, the more I learn, and the more I become aware of subtleties or differences. And there are some books where I'm sitting there saying, how did I enjoy this the first time around? Because the communication is non-existent. I don't know that I'd call that consent. Like, cool, congrats, you're fated to do this, but like maybe ask first. And part of that is in mainstream media. You know, we're, we're taught from a very young age that no means yes, and yes means yes, and basically everything means yes if you just push hard enough and ask long enough, well, you'll persevere, but no, the answer was given. Or, you know, if you just, oh, you grab them and throw them against the wall, but are they consenting, like, or is this just your heteronormative fantasy? Like, and, and like I said, the more that I step away from that and read anything else, when I go back to it, I sit there saying, well, which is not to say that all cishet romance is bad because I have authors that I adore because they've done the legwork they've changed and grown with the times and their characters communicate and it very clearly reflects what's happening and so I'm sitting here saying this is fantastic and that third book you had let's talk about it but let's not talk about it and then the rest of them are fantastic and we all know that authors have hiccups somewhere the longer the series they're going to stumble because it's just the nature of the beast um But when the authors grow with their stories, that's what I love to see. I love to see that growth and I love to see the change because they are showing that they are engaged with what's happening. They want their readers to stay with them and they want their readers to understand the world is changing. And if they want to keep up, they have to, too. So it's lovely to see that. But it's also nice to see. And again, I found this more in the indie authors that base level of communication just seems to be higher than those in the mainstream published by cishet white men. <laughs> yep, absolutely. Are there any publishers that you want to give a shout out to for our listeners? Sure. Uh, Bold, Strolled, Bold Stroke Books, uh, Bella Books, um, Nine Star Press Publishing, there's a couple of others that my brain is trying to cough up desperately. And I will link those in the show notes in the description. So I think our time is wrapping up, Anita, but I always have a few questions up my sleeve for my guests. Um, there are five questions. Let's get through them. What is your favorite novel, your romance novel? Today or in general, because if it's the latter, I don't have one. <laughs> Whatever you define it as today. Hmm. What's your favorite romance novel? For today. 
<laughs> and it, it, it does change because it, it really is mood dependent. But for today, I'm going to go with Fletcher Delancey's Chronicles of Elsie, which is kind of a cop out because it's a series of 10 books. But. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> the series. Next question. Where slash how do you prefer to read? Are you a physical book, ebook, or audio? Anything but audio. Give me a book. I don't care if it is ebook. I don't care if it's paper. I don't care if it's on a tablet. Um, if I can put it in my hands or put it in front of my eyes, I'm a happy camper. So as our listeners may or may not know, we at Jace Reads Romance have this aesthetic called comfy sexy. And it stems from the idea that in your comfiest, safest environment, in your grossest PJs, in bed, on your favorite armchair, with your bunny slippers on, you are still a sexual, however you define it, person. So what does comfy sexy mean to you? Well, comfy means something comfortable, whether that is sweatpants and a tank top or shorts or my bed or an armchair. I, I can be comfortable reading upside down, hanging from a wall as long as I've got a book in front of me. Sexy, I really couldn't care less about because quite frankly, I just don't care. Uh, but comfy is literally anywhere with a book in my hands. I mean, so that's it. Comfy, sexy, Anita with a book in her hands. Um, so that also answers my next question is, when do you feel your sexiest or most attractive or most powerful? Mm, sexiest really couldn't care or quite frankly define. Um, attractive also still don't care. Um, powerful. That's a very good question that I don't have a very good answer to. Um, it's not something that I really think about on, on any given day. That's fine. Um, there is, the last question is, what do you want our listeners to know about sex and sexuality? Like, what is your soapbox thing? If it feels good and it's not harming you or anybody else, go for it. So whether you like sex, you love sex, you hate sex, as long as you're happy and you're safe and you're healthy and you're not harming yourself or anybody else, go to town. I love that. Listeners, take that to heart. Thank you so much, Anita, for sharing your time with me. I know that our listeners are probably thinking, where can we find them? Uh, you can't. They do not have a social media presence. So this is where you get to connect with them and uh, get their incredible insight. Have an incredible rest of your day. Thank you so much, Anita, for joining us. And this is Jace holding space for you. And that's it for today, y'all. This has been a Three Paws Productions podcast. You can find Jace and so much more at jacereadsromance.com. That's J-A-Y-C-E readsromance.com. Follow along on TikTok and Instagram at Jace Reads Romance. And if you'd like to send an email, our email address is jace at jacereadsromance.com. To leave a voicemail with a question or testimonial for a future episode, call and leave a message at 661-JACE-RR. That's 661-529-2377. And finally, like and subscribe so you can get every episode when they drop. And remember, this is Chase, holding space for you.